Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Deep Rob for discussion seven. Um, we're now pretty much like just about halfway through the course, which is uh, pretty amazing how fast, I really think it's pretty amazing how fast these semesters go by. Um, and in today's discussion, this is gonna be our first sort of prelude to these, um, to these exciting topics now that we're gonna start talking about in the seminar style lectures. So today's uh, prelude is about 3D perception. Um, so this is gonna be like a very broad overview of some of the topics, some of the applications that we're gonna be seeing next week, but really these themes are gonna continue on for the rest of the semester because the reality is that our robots operate in the 3D world um, and so they're not constrained to just pixel space. They actually have to deal with inputs that are not just constrained to pixel, like 2D pixels. Um, and also their outputs, when they take actions in the world, are gonna be wanting to consider the 3D space in which they can take actions. Um, so today's discussion is hopefully gonna set up some of these themes and lead in nicely to the uh, seminars which we'll have next week. Um, and with that, I don't have any administrative updates other than I'm still gonna upload that template that I promised. I just was having fun making my slides today and so I spent the time on my slides and not your slides, so I'll do that tonight. Um, any administrative questions I can answer before getting into it? I do have a lot of fun visuals in today's slides which I'm excited for. Okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, so just as a bit of an advertisement for next week's seminar styles lectures. So in the first lecture, we have the RGBD architectures papers. Um, so I've linked to all four of them on this slide in case you wanna kind of refer to them. I think one thing for these discussions that could be kind of interesting is you could probably open in like a few tabs some of these different papers and just kind of like skim through while I'm talking and you can probably find a lot of the themes represented in what I'm talking about. Um, so yeah, so, so on Tuesday's lecture, which is the seminar one, that's gonna be RGB architectures. So POS CNN is gonna be looking at doing six degree of freedom pose estimation based on RGBD input. The, um, the unified framework is gonna to try to pair in one CNN architecture both the RGB input and the depth image input instead of um, what POS CNN does, which is kind of separate the two and have like a multi-stage pose estimation pipeline. Um, PVN 3, 3D is like another pose estimation paper that's using 3D key points as like a voting mechanism. And then the fourth paper there, learning RGBD feature embeddings is, um, is an interesting one where we're sort of trying to like use RGBD, RGBD input to extract useful features as, as output. Um, so I won't go into any more detail about those specific papers. I don't wanna steal the thunder of the, of the seminar um, presentations, um, but those are gonna be some really exciting papers because all of these are very prominent papers in this, in this area. Um, and then following that, Leading in nicely is gonna be uh, our Thursday seminar on point cloud processing. So point clouds are a representation for geometries, so object geometries in 3D space. And you can do a lot of interesting things with point cloud processing. So we'll look today at an example of how the sensors that are on our robots often can produce point clouds. So for example, like that intro little clip was a point cloud that was being visualized. Um, and so these papers are gonna tie in very nicely with, uh, with that. And so that's kind of the ad for next week. It's gonna be some exciting seminars. With that, as sort of an ad for today's discussion, I wanted to play this, this kind of quick clip. Guess what will this change? And we can sort of listen in on, this is, the, this is showing actually the, an actual television stream as they changed from black and white to color. And it's very related to our transition from 2D perception to 3D perception. And all our new color sets here in the studio were designed with that in mind. The audio quality is not great. So this is what viewers at home watching would have seen as the actual transition happened, assuming that they could afford set, a Bob? color TV. Take it away in full spectrum color. Well, Doug, first I'd like to say this, that I feel doubly honored to have been chosen to be the first one involved in our big change because there are so many much more colorful characters around here than this reporter. So I think it's just kind of like a, for one thing, it's, 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 it's pretty amazing that that was captured like in real time, I think, that they actually managed to do that transition in real time. Um, but for our standpoint, that's exactly the transition really that we're going to, like, that we're going through now in this class. Because up to this point, we've just been focusing on 2D perceptions. We've just been talking about image classification, object detection, segmentation briefly, but it's always been constrained to this like 2D 
coordinate system of the actual image size. And we haven't actually considered the 3D world that where these images are actually being captured in. And so what we're doing by now moving to 3D perception is adding a whole new dimension to our perceptual input, very similar to how color te television went from the 1D channel of black and white to then add, they actually added two dimensions for the for like two color channels in, in addition to the one. Um, but that's that's kind of a I think like a fun way to think about this. So let's take a look at what some of this RGB, RGBD input or this kind of 3D perception input could actually look like. So in this video, this is the digit robot from Professor Grizzle's lab, and this is it just sort of walking around. And this is these are the these are the, the RGB color images that we're seeing, right? But it turns out that a lot of sensors can actually be paired with an RGB camera and also a depth camera. And so what that looks like from the depth camera point of view is you actually get for every single pixel coordinate in the image, you get some measurement of how far away the ray traveled from the camera's origin to an actual surface in the 3D world um, in, in meters, like so in some unit of distance. And so the, the color scheme then that, then that we're seeing is just a representation of that depth. So in reality, the, the depth image that we get has just a single channel, but to make it more easy to actually kind of understand as humans, it's useful to use a color mapping to take that one channel of depth and then produce like a color image. For our networks, they're not gonna do that. So our networks, when they're consuming RGBD images as input, what they're gonna have really is the, the three color channels. So you'll have, in this case, maybe like some, uh, you'll have like your color image on the left, which has the, like I said, like the three channels, and then it has like 1,920 pixels in width, maybe 1,440 pixels in the height. And then there's gonna be this separate one dimensional, uh, or like one channel array, which is the depth, uh, which is the depth image. So you have, for every single pixel, correspondingly in the, in the color image, you have this, this depth value. Um, and so if you put those two together, the way that you can think about RGBD images is really not too dissimilar from how we've been thinking about RGB images. You just concatenate that channel dimension so that your input to, the, to any of these networks or to any other processing algorithm that's gonna be taking these, this sensor data as input is this four channel tensor. So you have like your RGB channels plus, in terms of concatenation plus, the depth channel. And so overall it's still this 3D tensor that we could potentially pass through some deep neural network to perform a variety of different tasks. And so RGBD images have been used for a huge number of tasks within computer vision and within robotic perception. So on this slide, I'm just listing out some of maybe the more common ones that you might think of, but this is not a complete list. Like RGBD input um, is used for all sorts, of, like for truly like all sorts of tasks. Um, and so for one thing, which I, we'll talk like a little bit more about the sensors on the next slide, but these depth sensors are very cheap. So a lot of phones, like even the phone that I have, which actually is what this data was collected with, um, have depth sensors on them. So they have some form of depth sensor that can, that can uh, produce the, the input. But that just goes to show that, that these sensors are so cheap, you can afford, like if you can afford an RGB camera, it's pretty likely that you can afford so, at least like a, moderately, like a moderate quality depth sensor to go with it. Um, and so because you're adding this data, which is maybe not perfectly orthogonal to color, but it's at least a different modality than color, the thinking goes, if we add this other modality, our, our algorithms for maybe doing detection or segmentation or scene completion, they can be better because they have this, this other information that they're not necessarily getting from just the color. Um, so what types of tasks have RGBD inputs been used for? So you can use RGBD images as input to just a 2D object detector or a 2D instance segmentation network, just like you could with, with um, like just the RGB images. So you could, you could define like a mask RCNN that uses four channels of input instead of three and train it correspondingly to just do like the 2D object detection and so forth. But, and you will probably see like some improvement, but where you'll see more of an improvement is when you start looking at, at um, tasks like 3D object detection, where now your bounding boxes are not defined just in terms of like the pixel coordinates, but actually you want a 3D bounding box in the world coordinate frame about where there's objects of interest. So in that case, the depth is hugely helpful because the color information um, can sort of be deceiving when it comes to actually understanding the, the 3D world. But having that depth grounding can make your performance much, much better. Um, in addition, there's, there's tasks like 3D instance segmentation, where if you imagine the 3D world as a set of surfaces and you try and segment, so you try to essentially like 
produce a label for every single point or every single vertex on the surfaces within the 3D world. That's instance segmentation, and RGBD inputs are used very commonly there. Um, 3D reconstruction is another one where you might have, and this is kind of like related to like 3D semantic scene completion, where maybe like you get in some RGBD image which is not complete, and so you want to sort of like uh, try to improve maybe the depth image that you get by um, by sort of like denoising it, or maybe like try to estimate what's behind objects where there's occlusions in your in your input. So based on the specific camera view, for example, this, like even in this image, like we can't see what's behind digit, but all of us in our heads, like in our mind's eye, we can very confidently predict or kind of project that the wall behind digit is still behind digit. Like that it doesn't just stop and then there's like nothing. Whereas from the standpoint of an RGBD camera, um, and I think I'll have a video kind of showing this later on, but the occlusions, like when there's a, when there's a surface in front of other surfaces, all, everything behind the first surface just is like, is like ignored. So what we can try and do maybe is have like a, a deep neural network that could actually um, try to complete the scene and try to like complete what is not observed directly by the sensor. In addition then there's like other common tasks like six off pose estimation, which uh, benefits a lot from using the depth as well. So yeah, so these are RGBD images, and you might be wondering then, like, at a, like where are we actually getting the, the depth data? Like the camera data, we can all believe because we all have experienced now camera, like RGB color images for quite a while, but these depth images might seem a little bit new. So what are the sensors like that actually produce these? Well, I'm not a hardware expert in terms of sensors, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just at a high level, there's three broad classes of sensors which you'll typically see used for RGBD imagery. Um, the first is what's called stereo cameras. So this is where you would take more than one just RGB camera and you would displace them spatially. So you'll, most of the time you would use two, but sometimes you, like you can, you can use more than two. Um, in fact, there are products on the market sold that do stereo vision. I, both can't, like both like on the backs of phones, there are certain phones that have like 10 different cameras, but also just like as standalone cameras. There are stereo vision cameras. And um, what they'll do is if you, have, if you have a known displacement between the two cameras and you record an image on, let's say, both cameras, the features in the two images will be slightly misaligned in terms of the pixel coordinates. So you'll see maybe like the same corner of some object in, in the scene in both images, but they won't be at the same pixel co coordinate because the cameras are offset. So if you, can, if you can identify what the correspondences are at the feature level between the two cameras, and you know what the displacement is between the two stereo vision cameras, you can actually estimate what the depth is to each feature, which is essentially every pixel in the two images. Um, the one issue with these is you need to be able to find those correspondences at the feature level between the two cameras. So any pixel in one of the two images where you can't find a correspondence will have no estimate for what the depth is. So you could try to smooth it maybe, but that's one downside. Um, the other downside with the stereo cameras is they're gonna suffer from all of the issues that RGB cameras suffer from, which most notably is having a limited ability to handle what's called dynamic range. So RGB, like digital RGB cameras are pretty bad at very high light environments and very low light environments. So that's a really big issue for autonomous cars where cars are driving 24 seven in high light environments where you have like the sun kind of like, um, like near sunset beaming kind of like into the cameras directly. And then also at night when there's like no light. Um, so, so stereo vision cameras will, will suffer from those issues. Um, a second broad class of sensors, which is very common, is structured light sensors. So what these do is they'll um, actually have an infrared light on the, like right next to the, um, to the actual camera sensor. And, and what they'll do is they'll project a known pattern out into the scene. So it's sort of like a grid-like pattern. I mean, it depends on the algorithm that's being used on the specific sensor, but imagine like a grid-like pattern being projected in infrared. So humans don't see it, but there is actually a wavelength of light being projected onto the scene. And then there's an infrared camera that records images at the same time, or it's like delayed enough so that the light has time to, to bounce off the scene and come back to the camera. Um, and what then, then there's an algorithm on the, like on the actual um, device that using the known pattern that was projected can estimate what the depth is uh, for, for, cert, for like some set resolution based on the, um, the quality of the sensor and then also like the pattern that's being projected. But that's the second broad class. And 
The downside was structured like camera, oh, like, so the upside is they don't depend on RGB. So humans don't see the infrared, so it doesn't disturb humans. And, um, and they don't depend on RGB, so they're pretty good in terms of dynamic range. The issue that they run into, though, is when there's environments that are highly reflective and you have sunlight, right? Because sunlight is a source of infrared light, that can actually disturb or kind of distort the estimated depth that you get as output from these structured light sensors. Um, so that's kind of the downside. The upside, though, is you can get um, really high resolution uh, depth recorded with them. So, so for indoor settings where you want like very, uh, like very high fidelity um, depth on like surfaces where you might want to estimate like object like geometries, stru uh, structured light sensors do a really nice job. Um, the other downside with structured light sensors, or like another kind of edge case where they fail, is because they're projecting this infra infrared light. If there's objects that either like redirect the infrared light away from the camera, like mirrors or transparent objects that might distort the pattern in a way that the algorithm is not accounting for, then you can get very noisy input in those kind of edge cases. But for most like opaque objects in indoor settings, these sensors do a nice job. Um, okay, and then the third class of sensors are what's called time of flight sensors. Um, so these are more similar to the structured light sensors than, than the stereo sensors, but they're distinct. So what they'll do is they're gonna also use infrared light, but instead of projecting a known pattern, they essentially project out like, like laser beams and they time, they record the time at which each, let's say like pulse of light was, was sent out, and then they record the time at which there was a corresponding response by, taken by the infrared sensor. And then using the known speed of the wavelength of light that they're projecting, they can actually estimate how far that light traveled. So this is a form of LIDAR. Um, so it's similar to radar, but we're using light waves instead of, instead of radio waves. And the upside of time of flight sensors is they tend to be more robust to the daylight issue that the structured light sensors have. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's a relative, uh, yeah, the, the downside with time of flight is at least for now, they don't, I think generally speaking at a set cost, they tend to not do quite high, as high resolution as the, struct, as the structured light. Um, but yeah, so these are the three broad classes of sensors that you'll typically see. As a brief aside, one sensor that is, is distinct, it's not capturing depth, um, but it's, been picking up some interest in the vision community and the perception community is what's called an event camera. So at the computer vision conferences and the robotics conferences in the past few years, it's been actually picking up like quite a bit of traction, these cameras. So what they do, and the reason I'm including them here is that um, they, in part because like there is this traction, so I wanted to give you a sense of what the community, like the field is kind of looking at in the future, but they're not recording depth. Instead, what they're trying to do is or the way I tied it into this 3D perception is if we say that the third dimension is time, then what event cameras are capturing is any change in the pixels of an image over time. So they are not gonna, any pixels in the image which don't have, a, have an intensity or a gradient change, like there's no edge, uh, like edges kind of moving in the image, those pixels are record nothing. Like the sensor pr produces nothing, just emptiness. But then if there's any features in the image which have moved spatially or come into existence that didn't exist previously, um, the event cameras will record those as events. And so the big benefit of event cameras that's being proposed is that they're really, really, really good at um, having high dynamic range. So for low light and, and that's just based on the actual like physics of, the, of how the optical sensor is, is implemented in comparison to RGB sensors. Um, so this is interesting, and there is this, like, there is a, a set of works recently that have, are, are exploring using deep neural networks with event cameras to actually process them. Because these are, compared to depth at least, these are, I would say, more, they're not, I would, fundamentally is the wrong word, but these are much more distinct images you're getting from the event cameras in terms of what features you're picking up than the depth cameras. Because most of the, most of the pixels in the image are actually empty with event camera images. So if you wanna see, I didn't put any videos in the slide, but if you wanna see videos, the workshop has a lot of papers with videos. Yep, exactly. So the Xbox Connect is a structured light sensor. Um, the, the, like the LiDARs on the iPhones are time of flight sensors. The Microsoft Azure Connect I think is a time of flight sensor um, in contrast to the Xbox Connect, like the older versions. Um, but yeah.
Okay, other other sensor questions I can answer. I don't like this is kind of like the extent of my of my like hardware sensor knowledge to be honest. Um, I treat the data as like being given to me by some magical electronic device. Okay. So yeah, so event cameras, they are something to look into. They, they, it, is, it is fascinating. And it's interesting seeing how some of the networks process the, the, the data from these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there there are. I I will admit it's I'm not the most well read with event cameras. I did put one paper up this morning that on the specialized sensor section of the paper list from ICRA, it was like the like a robotics conference that was doing that was using event cameras for I I think it was um, localizing the camera in space, which is certainly relying on some knowledge of depth um, to to like localize in space. Um, so maybe look there. Yeah. The, or I will, I will also point out, the organizers of these workshops have organized like a chain of workshops and generally um, it is growing but there's like a few labs in particular that really specialize and that paper I posted is from one of those labs that, at ETH, ETH Zurich that really like specializes in event cameras. So I would focus on their papers maybe first and then branch out. Yeah, right. So the, yeah, so the question was like, is this um, are event cameras really doing something similar to what algorithms maybe have been proposed to do in the past, like optical flow? Yeah. So what optical flow does is that's really like a, it's a kind of like a deterministic function that just describes how do pixels change from over time, like where do they move, like where do the features move? Um, and I'll also point out there's a really interesting paper on paperless called Scene Flow that does like 3D optical flow, which is kind of cool, I think. But apart from that, um, the Yes, event cameras are similar to optical flow. The difference, though, is that event cameras are, like, what ends up being recorded with event cameras is a lot more sparse than what optical flow will, will, will produce, like, than what a measure of optical flow on the same data would produce. So event cameras, like, they truly, they, they're extremely sparse. Like, if you look at the, at the output from them, they're, like, they're really, really sparse uh, sensing. But having said that, they work really well. Like you can, as these papers show, like they're actually really, really good still for a lot of the um, types of tasks that you would want to implement, like in an autonomous car. So for those online, event cameras for SLAM, there's a paper from, we think, that ETH group. OK, yeah, so, so the question was, is, is the main pitch of event camera, or is one of the pitches or like benefits of event cameras that because the inputs are so much sparser that the network could be much more efficient because there's like less data to process. So I'll point out that the way we've described convolutions will not necessarily be good for event cameras. So you might want to make some architectural changes that can handle the sparsity better to, to really benefit from the computational speed up that you're indicating or you're kind of like hinting at. Um, so there's that. The second thing, I think that there's a few different, I think that the motivations behind event cameras, from my understanding, there's been a few different um, there's been a few different motivations. One of them is that event cameras are closer to actually how our biological optical systems work. Um, so, so I think there's interest in studying event cameras as an engineered model of more biological systems versus an RGB camera. So op event cameras are closer to our optical systems than RGB cameras are. There's that. Um, I think another case is like the high dynamic range, the fact that these have better high dynamic range high dynamic range than RGB cameras makes like a lot of industry interest. And then, and then I think also, yes, you're right, that like there's a potential huge computational speed up, assuming that all the information we need to do like detection and recognition and things are still, is still somehow there. Maybe there's a lot of computational speed up because it's so much more sparse input, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's true. I was ignoring that. But yeah, there's something like microsecond frame rate. They're really fast, like way faster than RGB cameras. Um, and I haven't looked too much into the sensor. I'm wondering if that's due to partially the sparsity that you, like you'd have less data to transmit basically. But yeah, I've never worked with event cameras. It'd be interesting to though. I'm not sure if anybody here has, by Michigan has an event camera. Okay, so yeah, so event cameras are something to be aware of. Um, but back to 3D as depth. Um, the, so we talked about RGBD images, so that's one of the big input modalities that we'll have for 3D perception. The other big input modality, which we're gonna be talking about next week, are point clouds. So what are point clouds? Well, for one thing, there's a point cloud being visualized on this slide. Um, so that is a point cloud that you're looking at. It's a point cloud, though, that's been rendered now onto the 2D screen. So it's been kind of flattened into back into 2D space, but that's just the way that we can present information um, effectively for now. So, okay, but what, is a, but what is a point cloud more like uh, by definition? So a point cloud is just a discrete collection of 3D points. So what that point cloud is meant to represent is some 3D geometry in, in a 3D space. Um, so like a Euclidean 3D space is what we'll be thinking about when we think about point clouds. Um, and so if we were to represent this as a tensor, one point cloud with n points would be an n by three tensor. So there'll be like an x coordinate, a y coordinate, and a z coordinate for every one of the points on the point cloud. And so this visualization, what we're showing is from that same sequence that we looked at like on the very first title slide, we're showing uh, this point cloud, so we're showing all the points on the point cloud point cloud in the 3D space that's now being projected into the 2D plane of the slide. Um, but what we do as the view sort of changes here is we're moving the projection. Like we're, we're sort of trying to highlight the actual points in space as if, the, as if our perspective was rotated up into like a bird's eye view. So I think it'll take a couple more seconds before, it's like this, like we're, we're rotating as an observer above the scene. And this is just highlighting what the points actually look like. Um, so you can see like we have a surface of points or like a set of points on the robot itself and then we don't see anything, we don't, s our camera doesn't pick up any points beyond the robot that's now been occluded by the robot. Um, so that's like that fact that there's like this big occlusion behind the robot in this case it, and what I mean by that is like this whole section here where there's like a white like empty region. Um, that's really just a fact of how I've created this, this point cloud. And so how I created this point cloud was I took the depth image that we got from my RGBD camera, and then because the camera was calibrated, uh, we knew what the actual, what's called a projection matrix is from the, from the 3D world into the 2D camera plane on the sensor. So that, like from the factory, let's say, they calibrated the camera and they gave that to us. Um, but using that knowledge and using the depth map, what you can do is you can, invert the projection. So essentially, you know for every pixel in the original RGBD image that you had, you know what the ray direction from the camera sensor out to the specific pixel value is, like a specific pixel coordinate. And so every pixel coordinate has a slightly different ray direction. So imagine just tracing out along each of those rays through the, through the 2D pixel grid um, at a length of the depth that we got from the depth map. That's how we're producing this point cloud. So we're transforming the depth image into a set of 3D points, and then we're plotting those 3D points in this, in this space. In addition to that, I mean, the one other thing that we're doing here, which is a little bit deceiving, is we're coloring the points once we've projected them out into the 3D space based on the RGB color from our image. So point clouds don't always have this color information. We're showing that here because it's a nice visual. It's much more interpretable for us humans to, to understand, but a lot of the times it's possible to have point clouds which don't have color features associated with them. So how would those point, types of point clouds come about? Well, the source for those is the, is the second source then that I've highlighted in this, um, like on this slide down, wherever my cursor, down at the bottom here. So where we would get colorless point clouds is, generally speaking at least, it's like where we would have some object geometry. So we'd actually have like a set of, of vertices and faces like uh, 
surface faces describing an, some object. So that could be an object like a table, it could be a can, there's anything in the 3D world you can imagine you could describe as a set of vertices and faces, at least up to some approximation error. And if you, let's say, sample from the surface of those faces or you sample from the set of vertices describing an object, that will give you a set of points in 3D space that have no color information. Uh, and so that's where you might get a source of point clouds that don't have a color information, but they still have these, these 3D points. Um, so generally speaking, I would say at least in robotics, those are gonna be the two main sources of point clouds that we're really gonna be thinking about. We're gonna have point clouds that have color information along with them, which are really coming from these RGBD images. And then we're gonna have point clouds that don't have color information, and those are usually coming from object geometries. So like an OBJ file, or some, like a PLY file, some object representation in terms of vertices, faces, meshes, these are all kind of synonymous. Um, questions on, on point clouds? We'll talk more about some of the things we can do with point clouds now, but before we move on, how we represent point clouds, how, we're, how we made this visualization. Okay. So, yeah, so these are point clouds. And what are the types of tasks that we might want to perform with point clouds? Well, one thing we might want to do is classification, right? So recognizing what object is in a point cloud. So let's say maybe that we run in like a 2D object detector like mask RCNN on the RGBD image. We could then extract the point cloud representation um, from, that, from that cropped window that we get from the, from the object detector and then give it to a specialized like recognition algorithm that maybe is even better than our mask RCNN detectors. So maybe we would just train mask RCNN to just detect objects and then we would give it to some specialized point cloud network to actually detect the different classes. That might be one, one use case. Um, so this idea that we have a point cloud as input and we're trying to give then a single category label for what is, for what object we think is in the point cloud. Um, so we'll see this application for some of the papers I think uh, on next Thursday. So what this, yeah, so what this might look like is we might want like just one label, which is that in this point cloud there's the digit robot. Another use case, which is maybe a little bit more common, is where we give input to some neural network, a point cloud, and we expect then some category label for every single point in the point cloud. Um, and what, what those labels should correspond to are the objects of interest that we're considering in our, in our task definition. Um, so in this case, for example, like this yellow blob that's been highlighted is highlighting all the points in the point cloud that correspond to digit. Um, so we might want to segment the point clouds. And what that might be useful for, if you wanted to imagine, right, is like once you've segmented the point clouds, then you could actually crop out not just like bounding boxes in the point, in the point cloud form, but actually like individual points. Um, so once again, you could then crop out all these points. You could sample from them and pass them to like a specialized pose estimation network if you wanted to now estimate the pose of digit. That's actually a pretty common technique. Um, in pose estimation. You'll generate a, a point cloud that's been subsampled from your overall set of points, like a uniform sampling of points on the region that you think is an object, and then you'll try to estimate the pose using that subsampled point cloud. Um, so that's one, one example of like a downstream task that you can use segmentation for. You could also potentially use this directly for like an input to, to some like robotic planner. So maybe if you estimate the point cloud on like an object that you might want the robot to pick up, if you have a segmentation of the points, even if you just like averaged those 3D coordinates, that might be a reasonable grasp location. Um, so in certain use cases, that might actually work. And by certain use cases, I mean in fairly structured environments, something as simple as that could work. If you talk about unstructured environments like a human home, you probably want like an actual grasp detection algorithm running, some, some deep neural network probably, that will detect the grasp locations, but in like a factory setting, Segmentation of point clouds can be useful for that. Um, another use case of point clouds is what's called point cloud registration. So this is, a, this is a task that's been around for a long time. So if you've ever heard of the algorithm iterative closest point, ICP, that's an example of a point cloud registration algorithm. Um, there's been extensions to ICP that will embed neural networks in different um, parts of the algorithm. And so what, what, what point cloud registration tries to do is it says, okay, let's say that we're given as input some object geometry which is represented once again as like a set of vertices and faces. And we also have a second input, which is a point cloud. So what that might look like in this case is maybe we have as input like the object geometry for each of the parts on digit, which is what's shown in this overall image. 
but in particular, we might be given just the object geometry for, the for this left shoulder of digit. And we're given then the point cloud that we observed from our camera. And what we want to somehow do is actually define a rigid body transformation that would transform the object geometry into the uh, uh, coordinate frame of the, uh, of the point cloud observation. So in other words, we want to know exactly how to fit the object geometry into the point cloud, such that all of the points on the object geometry have corresponding points at the same spatial location as the point cloud for just the points that observed this specific object geometry. So one way to describe that output is as a rigid body transformation that would move the geometry into the point cloud's coordinate frame. Another kind of output that you would get from that, if you could define that transformation, is all the pairwise point correspondences between the point cloud that observed this part and the, and the object geometry itself. So registration is often used for pose estimation. That's one of these cases. But having said that, ICP extends beyond point clouds. So in the context of point clouds, usually it's pose estimation. OK, so that's registration. Another use case for, for point clouds is doing key point detection. Um, so you can imagine we're given some input point cloud, and then we want to um, kind of uh, summarize that point cloud down into a smaller set of points, which describe what are the important locations that I maybe want to consider the pose of digit. So this might be, in this case, we're showing 17 um, key points that are at the different joint locations on digit. Um, but you could alternatively, so like one of the papers, and I, yeah, we're definitely going to cover this later on, like KPAM um, uses a key point representation for, for doing pose estimation at category level, um, which is a very effective approach. Um, so key point detection extends beyond just like this vague notion of describing key points. Key points are really useful as a representation for downstream tasks like pose, for planning, for, um, for taking action in the world. Usually having key points is a good uh, is a good representation to use. Okay, so there's key point detection. And then the last use case, I think for my slides here, is um, are these, so, so surface re reconstruction, which is a pretty broad task. Um, so if we imagine having um, like a set of images come as input, one thing that we can do is what's called photogrammetry, where we try to recover what the actual complete geometry is. So let's say that we have this set of images, which it looks like a video, Okay, it is a video, um, of this Campbell soup can, what we might want is some algorithm um, that could actually produce all of those vertices and fascia, fa faces, which, which would overall produce an object geometry. So this should hopefully kind of completely describe the surface of the object of interest. A similar task, which falls, I would still say, within surface reconstruction, is just mapping in general. So let's say that we have some sequence of images that we're taking, and Maybe we also have an IMU attached to the robot. Maybe we don't. But let's say we take in some, some sequence of images, and what we want to do is actually reconstruct not just one object in the scene, but actually create a map, like a high-fidelity surface reconstruction of all of the, of all of the um, surfaces in this scene. So that's another use case where both RGBD input or alternatively point cloud input can be really valuable. Um, and so the reason why is you might want to represent the output scene reconstruction as point clouds, because maybe you don't have like a, a good representation for surfaces, or alternatively, vice versa. Maybe the point clouds are inefficient, and you have a good representation for surfaces, and you want to use surface output, but maybe you have point cloud input. So I'm just pointing, so, so like these examples here, you could potentially implement with RGBD input. You could potentially implement with point cloud input. Um, but they're within the context of 3D perception, where you'll see them pretty often, and they're, I think, pretty exciting use cases. Let's see. So with that, we're, we're close to the end here. Um, just a couple things I wanted to point to you, point you to is a few resources that are very useful in the context of 3D perception and deep learning. So the first is Point Cloud Library. So this is a really, really large, uh, long-standing open source project for doing all sorts of point cloud processing tasks. So registration algorithms are implemented in PCL. There's um, key point detection algorithms implemented. There's a lot of visualization. It's fully integrated with ROS, so if you have um, point cloud data coming from the robot, you can integrate it nicely with PCL for like iterative close, closest point and things like that, already implemented for you. And then another one, which is more towards the deep learning end, is PyTorch 3D. So this is a Python library that's 
intended for doing deep learning with 3D data. So it's built on top of PyTorch. So it is a, um, there's sort of this kind of like cottage industry that's formed around PyTorch and also TensorFlow, where for specific use cases of deep learning, there will be these extension libraries developed that are for the, for the, for like the niche use cases. So in this case, 3D perception or just 3D modeling with deep learning is the, is the intention of PyTorch 3D. So what that means is they have a lot of class definitions and utility functions that would be useful for processing 3D data. So for example, rendering. They have rendering built into PyTorch. So it's a fully differentiable rendering engine, which is really nice because if you're doing a pose estimation and you want to render what the output pose is, or if you have input uh, point cloud data and you want to render and visualize that point cloud data, you can use PyTorch 3D and keep it all on tensors and have it be in Python so you don't have to um, communicate between different languages or different frameworks. So that's very nice. Um, I'll point out though, like there are, there are other extension libraries for other use cases. So there's like a Pyro library for doing deep learning with, um, with probabilistic modeling. There's a few, there's like a number of others. If you're interested on the PyTorch website, they highlight some of the big ones. Um, and this is one of the fairly, fairly big ones. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so, but rendering isn't the only one in PyTorch. They also have like representations for point clouds and um, they have some like backbone feature extractors for, for like 3D data that can be useful, which aren't in PyTorch itself. So you can think of PyTorch 3D as sort of being like a torch vision, but for 3D data instead of just computer vision. And with that, I think that's all the slides that I have today. Um, so hope, this now gives, I think, hopefully a nice overview of 3D perception and all the types of tasks, or at least some of the types of tasks that we'll be considering with our 3D perception data. And so we're gonna have our first seminar on Tuesday, second seminar on Thursday, and I'm super excited for them. They should be really fun. Um, definitely come out. Uh, it's definitely, it's collegial to support your fellow students who are presenting, and it's, like these are really exciting papers. So you're gonna get a really good overview of the field from these seminars. And with that, I'll stick around to answer any questions. Have a good have a good weekend.